floods have been making headlines lately. Bangladesh, the US, Italy, Libya. People across the world have experienced some of the worst events on record. And with global warming changing weather patterns, flooding will just become more and more likely. When floods strike, we're used to seeing the immediate aftermath, destroyed buildings, streets underwater, and death tolls. But what you don't often see is the huge impact on people's health that lasts far beyond the event itself. These are the unexpected health threats of flooding. When you think about floods, especially if you've never been affected by them, it's easy to think of health risks like drowning or hypothermia. And of course, that's not wrong. Though the reality for people hit by flooding is much wider ranging and can continue for months or even years once the water clears. This was the case for Pakistan. In 2022, record-breaking floods submerged a third of the country. Soon after, the number of malaria cases quadrupled to at least 1.6 million, the highest in over 30 years. And it wasn't just malaria. Cases of dengue, typhoid, and skin infections surged to name a few. Outbreaks like these are incredibly common after a flood. Take Bangladesh. In 2023, excessive rainfall combined with high temperatures and high humidity contributed to the country's most severe outbreak of dengue on record. The same year, in the Philippines, leptospirosis cases jumped due to increasing flood water. And Libya's floods during Storm Daniel caused a spread of diarrhea which had the potential to spark a second devastating crisis. But why does flooding cause a surge in these types of diseases? Well, periods of intense rainfall and floods can lead to a buildup of water, from small spots like people's rooftops and water storage containers to large pools of it, especially where outdoor drainage isn't effective. This water is a perfect hatching ground for the mosquitoes that carry diseases like dengue and malaria. As the flooding intensifies, it can also infiltrate and damage sanitation facilities, causing sewage systems to overflow, contaminating people's homes and water supplies. This can then spread waterborne diseases like cholera and hepatitis A. Floods are, by their nature, highly destructive. Whilst they make epidemics more likely, they can also disrupt an entire country's health infrastructure, reversing years of disease control. Damage to businesses and loss of income could also result in some people prioritizing their livelihood sustenance over their health care. That was Professor Collins Awuje from the Africa Health Research Institute damage to residential homes and forced displacement in people can result in them being housed in temporary shelters which are often overcrowded and because of this overcrowding there's loss of privacy and no confidentiality so people suffering chronic diseases like HIV might be reluctant to disclose their status to healthcare providers due to stigma and it extends beyond infectious disease Access to ongoing medication, surgery, birth control and period care are all interrupted by large flooding disasters. So what about impacts beyond the physical? If we go back to Pakistan, where recent flooding caused a surge in malaria cases, another health crisis was underway. A crisis in mental health. With locals of all ages distressed by the floods, the loss of life, land, livelihood, there just wasn't the right support readily available. When people live through a flooding disaster, chances are they witness a potentially traumatic events. This can lead to high levels of psychological distress. Some might even develop mental health problems, like post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, or substance use disorders. We asked Catherine Butler, associate professor at the University of Exeter, for one reason why this might be happening. Evacuation, displacement, so people having to move out of their homes to other areas can break up communities and, and really destroy the support networks that might otherwise reduce the mental health impact of the flood. And it's not just the direct impact of floods. Unemployment, food and water insecurity or homelessness following the disaster can also affect mental health. There's also a mental health burden associated with the people that are responding to floods that are um, involved in the response process. Certainly in our research in the UK, it was evident that the people that had been first responders in a lot of instances of flooding had experienced uh, mental health issues as well. This meta-analysis reviewed 23 different studies on the mental health impact of floods around the world. Although rates did vary a lot between events and decreased over time, it found that almost three in every 10 flood survivors experienced post-traumatic stress disorder. 
The thing is, individuals, families and communities often show high levels of resilience in the face of extreme weather events. According to a 2010 study, most people fully recover or maintain good mental health if they can access the right support. But with escalating and more frequent flooding disasters, we don't know if this sort of resilience can last in the long term. So, climate change is making flooding events more likely and more extreme. Both the physical and mental health impacts are going to grow. We urgently need more research and policy action to bring in adaptations at scale, helping communities adapt to floods. For example, we can protect more natural floodplains, rivers and coastlines to manage flood risk. We can build flood defences. And we can roll out accurate flood forecasts which help teams to prepare reducing the damage. During the time of a disaster or a flood is not the time to start putting people together to respond. It should not be a reactionary thing. This should be like teams that are already existing. They are trained. They know what to do when there is a flood event or any other extreme weather event. Though, to put it bluntly, these adaptations won't be enough. We urgently need our governments to support the transition away from fossil fuels if we want to prevent climate change from getting any worse and limit the disasters in the first place. I think we need long-term studies on both the physical and mental health outcomes, especially amongst vulnerable individuals like children, the elderly, pregnant women, people with disabilities. But we need data prior, during and after the floods. There is hope that if we do all this, we may be able to minimize those exposed to floods. But as recent events have shown, we can't wait around. We need action now.